Hello, and welcome back to Mix Sessions, Emmy Awards season. I'm Tom Kenny. I'm the editor of Mix, and we have a different kind of panel for you right now. Uh, we thought that in the midst of looking at these projects and these Emmy Award-worthy soundtracks, that we would bring together some folks that, from multiple sides, uh, some supervising sound editors, re-recording mixers who are going to talk about the television environment. Uh, so I'm privileged today to be joined by Danica Wick. Uh, who works out of Formosa Group and has worked with a lot of comedies. I understand that. We've got uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the Andy Samberg thing, Back Days, Better Things, Woke recently for uh, for you and the Woke crowd. We have Joe Schultz. Uh, Joe's on them right now. Very big hit there in April, Joe, with the premiere, correct? Uh, Thank yeah. you, yeah, absolutely. Uh, at Amazon Studios, uh, Prime Video release, uh, a lot of attention. We'll certainly be talking about that, but Joe's Joe works out of Waterman Sound. Is this correct, Joe? Out of uh, Toluca Lake. You have a facility correct. down there at Water, Waterman. We're going to, we'll check that out. Uh, I'd like to hear about that. So, Odin Benitez. Um, Odin has a lot of background in the feature film world, uh, if I'm not mistaken. We have Frozen and Frozen 2 on your credits. <laughs> Congratulations. That's, that's yeah, really thank you. Um, and here in Emmy season, you are working on uh, the ultimate playlist, I understand. Yeah, ultimate Correct. playlist of noise. Yeah, the ultimate playlist of noise. So, uh, congratulations on that. So we have a nice blend, and that's certainly one of the themes that television and film are techniques are merging. Let's start there. Uh, the changing television environment. Uh, this isn't new to the pandemic years. We've seen the rise of streaming services, the rise in quality, the rise in demand. Uh, Danica, should we start with you? Um, what have you seen the last five years in terms of content? I mean, just what? So the last five years, yeah, I feel like the platform for television is definitely uh, increased. I mean, so many ways to watch television um, has just exploded. Um, and it's, it's, in a way, hard to keep up um, on shows, right? Um, and so, in a way, it's great because, you know, there's such a desire and want for it. So it keeps us, you know employed in that sense and also uh you know the creatives coming up with these shows is it's, there's a platform for them but um you know it's it, it's getting to be the turnaround time is just crazy because um you know something comes up and then they want it delivered and and then shown you know right away so it's it's quick joe, joe you uh Three-time Emmy winner, I understand, for Lost. Is that correct? Uh, so, so you go. Well, no, I was I was involved in that, but uh, yeah, we didn't win. Oh, I'm sorry, the nominee. Three-time yeah. nominee. nominee but, uh, you, so you've been in television, <laughs> big shows for a while now, and you've seen certainly this transition and what's gone on in the last decade. Um, care to comment on that? Yeah, I think I actually got a little lucky because I worked in features when I first uh, started for about three and a half years, so I got. I saw that world and then I moved over into TV, into network television specifically, which was pretty run and gun, but um, definitely in the, you know, wanting to keep that quality as good as possible. But the time, the t you only had so much time. So I kind of got used to uh, that schedule, which is uh, just, you know, increased ever, ever more so in the, qu in the quality that's demanded and uh, the schedules being what they are. And everything back then, 5.1, correct? I mean, for the last 10 years, you're doing 5.1 sound and now Dolby Atmos, I presume, right? Correct, yeah, I actually had just converted my studio over at the beginning of 2020 to Atmos for to future proof it and then the first uh the first show i did them was uh was a five yeah, inch. of course that's so the way i haven't had to deliver atmos yet but i can't um odin you're, you're straddling both worlds right now um schedules budgets craziness uh what do you see yeah well i mean i started out um in like the 90s uh working on tv movies of the week you know when we still cut on film and uh after that i worked pretty almost exclusively in the feature world and then uh just recently because of streaming, um, there's just a lot more platforms. Like I, I worked on the night of, uh, which is like long form, uh, you know, uh, it's a series. And then, um, uh, worked on, uh, this feature, the ultimate playlist of noise, which would normally be like a feature film, but because of streaming, there's, you know, these films are, are kind of added to that list. And then I also work on, um, um, I also work on, uh, uh, another show for Apple. But but the idea being that we are, I mean, the schedule. I mean, let's 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 just go to schedules. 
I mean, let's just go to there then start. Do you want to pick up there the scheduling differences that you've seen sort of? I mean, is TV as hectic as people make it seem? Yeah. So like on the the other um, episodic thing I do for Apple is called Truth Be Told. And uh, that uh, for me, working on a a truly television episodic show like that, uh, the schedule is really hectic where you're working on two or three different episodes all at once. And and then you just start getting confused you know, like what is this happening in episode 206 or 208 and and people start in different timelines editors will de- deliver things that start at you know 59:30, and others will start at 59:53, and and then it just you have to really you know it keeps you on your toes um or organization is key i would imagine right right <laughs> exactly exactly but it's a lot of fun i mean one of the things i really like about working on uh uh on truth be told is, is being able to work with the actors more closely because, um, you get a chance to really work with them and, and direct them. And, uh, so it's been a lot of fun for me. Danica, do you, uh, I apologize. Your last name is wiki. My apologies for earlier, but Danica, okay. um, you've lived in the TV world for a while. You have comedy a lot to your credit. I'm sure you've done other things, but the, the, the speed of the, of just the materials and the physical part, how does that work? So I've kind of noticed, um, at least with my experience, uh, shows that air on a network like NBC or or Fox or something like that, I feel like have a more regimented schedule in the sense where like, uh, you know, we we always mix on, say, a Wednesday and we always do ADR on on a Tuesday or, you know, a Monday or something. It's very every week you kind of know exactly what's going to happen. Whereas shows that maybe are for Disney Plus or Netflix, um, it's more of just chaos <laughs> in a way where because um, there's not always an air date, right? So they just want to get it out um, and not everything is as regimented. Um, and so those shows are a little bit more chaotic in the sense of just trying to get things in line and, and you know. Just yeah. in the, very, the, the production part of it. Joe, same experience, Joe? Yeah. I mean, yeah, actually, it's in reverse. So I started in uh, the very regimented network aspect, which was you delivered the show aired on Sunday, you delivered on Thursday. This is what it was week after week after week. And then moving into the streaming world, uh, that definitely changed. So it was um, you're either going to deliver all these episodes at the end, you're going to deliver some now, you're working on multiple episodes at the same time, which is great. Um, in certain regards, because you have the ability to come back to things like on them, we had things where we discovered things later down the line that we found, you know, and, uh, we said, Hey, you know what, this would work in episode two, that, that little moment we had. So we were able to go back, which we never had the ability to do that. And building up themes and sort of, uh, points that, that you can tease in there. Well, this, I mean, imagine in the workflow that this, this is part of leading into blurring the lines between the supervisor and the mixer. Um, is this happening? Because I would think with compressed schedules, you have to work in a way that you may not have before. I was the mixer on them. I would, I, I, uh, it didn't start that way. I had, I had hired in, uh, a guy named Scott Lewis, who I'd worked with before to be my mixer because, um, as Odin was saying, like, I like being a supervisor. I don't want to be just a supervisor or a re-recording mixer. I like supervising. I like working with actors. I like, I, I, I really like that a lot. And um, so on that, I knew that schedule wise, it was going to be tough for me to, to cover all that ground, which I had had done before with my post producer on Once Upon a Time. We had kind of carried that same thing over. It was an option, but I, um, I also had another project that I knew was going to overlap a little bit. So, um, so originally, yeah, I'm always, I always, uh, you know, talk to the, the mixer and say, Hey, this is what I'm, I'm hoping for what you guys want to do. Uh, if I, if I have my relationship with my post producer where what they think and where they're at, um, and, uh, so that we can all be on the same page and, uh, trying to make you know, to do the best work we can with what we've been provided, either schedule or budget wise. Odin, do you notice uh, anything different in that editing mixing relationship that you, when you get to TV? Um, yeah, I think it's something that's sort of been evolving for a while. Where um, since the schedules have uh, have all become shortened, this also happens in low budget features too. That we're trying to come up with creative ways to to get this thing mixed in time. So we have to 
basically, you know, pre-dub to our best abilities in our seven one rooms or Atmos rooms if we have them. And um, we try to get all these things dialed in as close as possible, but also give flexibility to the um, mixers, like um, try to do EQs using, um, you know, clip EQ and, um, and clip gain to some degree, although sometimes clip gain can make the, you know, the sound hit the plugin in a, you know, not in an advantageous way because it hits it before the process, you know, rather than something like volume graphing. But um, so, yeah, so we try to do all this stuff in advance. So at least we give the mixers. I remember Greg Landecker used to talk about, you know, setting up pre-dubs as being little packages. And so we try to give the the re-recording mixers stuff that's in packages for them already. So now they can focus on the big picture. I mean, ideally, they would have loved to pre-dub everything and really get familiar, but sometimes it's just not possible. So, Which leads me creatively uh, uh, to sort of... Uh... Without that much time, you need to establish a base, I would presume. When you, when you get a show, whether it's limited series, episodic, documentary, uh, however you're working. Uh, and Danica, uh, let's talk about it. Because in comedy, we don't normally think of themes like we do in a, a drama or a, or a Star Trek type thing. So uh, how do you establish a base that allows you to meet that schedule I mean, what, from a sound editor's point of view? You know, you learn a lot from your first meeting, your first spotting session, I think, uh, you know, you really can dive in and kind of get to know who the creators are, who the execs are and, and what they're wanting. Um, and then you kind of uh, just dive in and see what honestly you can, you know, some some people are very rigid and that they want it just very, you know, dialogue first, you just want to hear dialogue, nothing really, you know, get those backgrounds out, right. And so you kind of have to cater to that. And then others, uh, they want to push it, you know? Um, and so that first mix, I always feel like is really a, a, the, you know, the sign of how you're going to move forward with the series. Cause that's kind of, once you get that first episode in, you kind of realize, okay, this is where everything likes to sit. This is kind of what they want. Um, and, and then after that, you kind of know where you, where you are. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Absolutely. And I, I would imagine with longer schedules, you have time to develop that. Um, but Joe, earlier you were talking about being able to work on multiple episodes. Does that help in establishing that baseline or that sound of the show? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, it just gives you more time to kind of explore. And uh, the beauty on them is we had the ability to, you know, this was, I think, unique to the, the pandemic. Obviously, uh, we had access to music much earlier than we ever would. So we were able to have that and I could feed that to my sound designer and she could start developing around that. And then that would come to the stage and I could take that and do my thing with it against the music. And uh, that was great. And, and again, having the ability to, to find something, a happy accident and be able to go back before you've delivered something and, and make it, make it better than it was, was, uh, you know, was, was great. Now for them, are you, you're on your stage and are your editors and stuff remote or are they in the building with you? Yeah. Yeah. Just all my editors remote. I had my assistant with me and, uh, and it was, uh, primarily me in the room. Occasionally in the beginning, my music editor, my post producer, we did a couple of playbacks originally before the lockdown happened. And then it was all remote from that point. Odin, uh, sort of that baseline which you establish in a film it's sort of the goal of a film correct um and then you're dealing with you know, sort of a television show now what, what what's your sense of establishing the base or the sound of what you're after yeah well like um you definitely have to what you're trying basically want to do is support the story so um i always have to start with an image and you don't like to come with any kind of like preconceived notion of what i'm going to do um you know, because it's, uh, you basically want to react to the film and help tell the story. So, um, like on, uh, episodic, uh, films, like on truth be told, um, the good thing about that is you get to work, you know, multiple episodes, you definitely develop a sound and this is the second season that we've done. So we've definitely got like a shorthand. Um, we do a lot more sound design than that, than it seems like a normal straightforward, uh, show, but there's quite a bit of like, you know, designing stuff that you may not even know. You may think it's music, but um, my uh, uh, designer, Chris Bonus, does an amazing job. And um, and something like we're truth, be, uh, we're on um, um, 
the uh, uh, the ultimate playlist of noise, which was uh, uh, we did for Hulu. And here was like basically, you know, what we considered a low budget feature that we had to raise and almost do like a like a TV movie in a way. Um, but we um, uh, uh, that we had uh, a chance to talk with the director, Bennett Lassiter, like in advance, like I even worked on the sizzle reel for him to get the movie made. So we kind of had an idea of what he wanted to go for. And so basically that movie was like treating everything very real. And then um, the, you know, the character in this movie is basically interested in recording sound effects. So that gave us the, the, you know, the fun thing of like, Hey, we're going to record the sound effects, even though you have a big monta music montage, you still hear these sound effects big. You know, so. And you love to record nature sounds. I know that, right? Yeah, uh, I've been doing it. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing it yeah, for sure. like 30 years. I remember my first That's recording was I record on Inagra and the first digital first dat recording first digital uh, audio tape recording i did i was recording a polo game and um I, you know yeah so you know like you, on inaugurate you kind of like you have a confidence head so you hear what you're recording on that you didn't really hear that so i didn't know well, what am i recording is it working and i rewound it back and and as listening you know it was a break in the polo game suddenly i hear these horses charging at me and i like, throw off the headphones and get out of the way and realize oh no it's you know, that, that was like an eye opening for me. It's like, wow, this is so realistic. There's no noise for it. You know? for a good recording. Yeah. Um, yeah. But not, not to take, you know, I mean, I think Nagra is great too. It's a, it's a great, uh, it's also a great medium. Well, let, let me ask you about this then, uh, because in, in television and certainly in film, uh, we deal with reality versus enhanced reality in sound. I mean, it's, it's very much so. Um, it, 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 television is it, is definitely introducing more sound design, I would say. Uh, can I get your takes on sort of how realistic you want to be? I mean, Danica, you have a you have fast paced comedy or or uh, or uh, somber comedies, uh, but uh, how, what about do you get to enhance reality there? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, it depends on the show. Obviously, um, you know, a show like Brooklyn Nine Nine is very. Uh, kind of regimented in the sense where you kind of know they're always going to be at the precinct throw, you know, and you want, you want that to sound real, you know, you want it to sound like you're at a workplace. Um, uh, but a show like better things that show every single episode is different. Um, it takes place at a different place. Uh, for the most part, you know, the characters are roughly the same, but there's a lot of, uh, just things, elements that come up that, you know, you're like, okay, I can maybe make this more, you know, have more fun with it than, than really, okay, it's just, you hear what you expect to hear. Um, and so that's where, you know, I think there's a time and a place, obviously, you know, um, but you, you kind of, if, if you feel like maybe you can take it there, try. And then if it doesn't work, doesn't work, but at least you, you know, you know, and you, and you get that, that experience builds up over time about what will work and what won't certainly if yeah, and you also get to know, you know, uh, the show and, and, and if they're going to be okay with maybe, you know, going outside the box a little bit. Some shows kind of want to stay in the box, you know, so it just depends. Speaking of going out of the box, Joe, you've worked on a few shows that sort of beg for sound design and horror and mystery and uh, anxiety. Um, uh, what's your notion on reality versus enhanced reality? And when can you play with both? I mean, any any time it, it's offered, I think, you know, um, really, uh, if it's there, I think if you hear it and there's somewhere to go, go with it and see if it works. And if not, you turn back and you start again to a point. Um, I did the show Made for Love for HBO Max right after them, and that was a dramedy. And um, so it was, uh, um, you know, we got to do a, it was much more straightforward from a sound design perspective, which was actually a bit of a relief coming off of them um, to, uh, and being a half hour, a half hour was a nice, it was a great show, but it was also a nice little bit of a catching of the breath and kind of like, oh, this is more, you know, a standard kind of thing to, to do. But um, in them, we, we played that, we tried to play that up a lot where it was very, stark reality what you're seeing was just very much and then and then there'd be a trigger moment and you'd go into heavy sound design everything else would peel away and it would be a music you know weird music or a weird sound design leading into a big either a jump scare or something else which was uh 
It was cool. I, I, I guess I have I've had a tendency to work on a fair amount of um, heavy visual effects type shows where them wasn't as much visual effects, but it had a lot of um, recutting of scenes for effect. And, um, and uh, it's, you know, I like it. It's a, it's a challenge and it's, uh, I like, I like that challenge. Odin, do you like, do you like reality or do you like to enhance reality? I mean, it's sort of like when we talked earlier about the base, that you have to establish that base in order to take it out there, correct? So when do you, when do you take it out there? And when do you find those moments, obviously, besides story? I mean, when do you, when do you feel it? Yeah, well, I kind of a, approach every film, at least with the base of reality to start with. And then, and then depending on even, uh, even animated movies, and then, and then you augment as needed. And so, like, for example, in the ultimate playlist of noise, we had a, a couple seizure moments, and that was a, an opportunity to do some sound design. And, uh, you know, the, you've got undercrank camera and, and, um, uh, and then also, um, one of the things about that movie is that we could take what would normally be a normal sound like a bowling, you know, we, we could sort of like enhance that to make it sound because because the whole film is about really hearing hearing sound. So, so, uh, and then on like, um, um, truth be told, there's a lot of flashbacks. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it's basically a true crime show. So there's a lot of like, you know, reenact almost, almost like reenactment type things, uh, that give us a lot and, and to kind of give us a spooky type of mood. Um, and so we're doing a lot of like, what would, I would say would be called traditional sound design with a lot of, you know, sound, you know, kind of like moody sound effects, groans or whatever it is that we're coming up with. And then, Another show like The Night Of, um, I was working really closely with Steven Zalian. In that case, we did, I would say that would be, we did a lot of sound design on that, but it was just about choosing the exact perfect sound for each moment, the perfect door close, the perfect, what does cars sound like in the rain when you're driving inside a car? And and uh, we really carefully chose just about every sound effect in that. And I, I think that, you know, gave it this you know, enhanced feels. This, yeah, this, this sense of design, but it's mm. as real as can be. And it's, I'm always interested in television with pacing. Uh, um, and it's sort of, uh, I want to start with you, Danica, about comedy, because comedians, um, they don't get to pause for a second. If, they, if a comedian on stage misses a half beat, uh, uh, it's over. A guitar player can do distortion. <laughs> so pacing in a show when you have 20, 22 minutes, 26 minutes, I mean, how do you deal with that in sound? It, it, you know, you have to, you have to be, you know, true to what's, what's happening on screen. And there's definitely some comedies that move, move, move. And, and then, you know, uh, like woke, for example, that was a, a very interesting uh, show to work on because uh, it was a comedy uh, but it was meshing uh, real world with um, animation. So trying to merge that those two worlds was uh, a challenge in the sense that, you know, take the, the animation out of it, there's comedy in real life. And then adding in what the main character is seeing in his own head, his animated characters coming to life. Who um, talk, right? It was the, very, the characters who talk. talk. Yeah. Yes, the trash can talks, um, you know, uh, everything. Yeah, anything that he's kind of seeing um, kind of comes to life and is, is talking to him. So um, trying to keep that, you know, movement um, and pace going is important. Um, and, and that all was interesting in the sense that we had to elevate, you know, the comedic moments sonically with the animated characters, with what was happening in real life. So um you know an example was uh, a bible you know starts talking to him and so we really you know played up some you know mu church music and 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 that whole you know um to kind of help sell that funny moment you know that this bible is trying to you know give him wisdom um you know so you just you can play with things like that when the opportunity knocks so well, one of the things I'm interested in is because we've introduced a uh, limited series now in addition to episodic, which, uh, you know, for a certain point, a limited series feels like an episodic and a certain point, a limited series feels like a nine hour, 10 hour movie. Um, and the pacing on that is different. Oh, did you want to comment on that? On, uh, the idea of a limited series versus a, sh versus a movie versus an ongoing episode? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, as far as like a feature, I've been trying to figure this out. But like, what makes 
I think in, in features there, uh, things are more heightened because you've only got like an hour and a half to, to tell the story. So in some cases there's more urgency in a feature, but you can have more character development in a television show. So, um, there, you know, it, it does get expanded, but I don't think it's just a different form, a different art form, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah. What do they call Do, do they call it a slow burn? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. they now call yeah, it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, eventually you have to deliver all your tracks to a final mix. I mean, uh, the interesting question is, is a final mix ever final? I put that on the notes. I mean, uh, never. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. But then, and then you have to deliver it. There are, uh, let's talk about the back end a little bit before we leave. Uh, it's changed, uh, correct? Not, not, not just when Netflix came out with deliverables a few years ago, and Dolby Atmos deliverables, and language deliverables. I mean, what's, what's your back end like? Do you want us to, Joe, you've been doing this uh, with, you know, dramas and, and uh, thrillers and TV for a little bit, but how's your back end changed? Um, well, I, again, I haven't done any Atmos, so my back end is fairly straightforward. I have my, I have my, rec- yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I have my recorder pretty well um, laid out where I make everything that needs to be delivered for basically anybody who needs it. Um, you know, uh, certain places require a mono comp, some don't, some want uh, a stereo DME versus a, a mono dialogue, mono effects and the stereo music. So I, you know, my recorder is basically, I hit record, I'm making pretty much everything that I've ever been asked for. And, um, and then, uh, you know, and then it's a matter of just kind of making sure it's, uh, the package is nice and clean and it's, uh, labeled ever perfectly and everything is right. And I, I, I like the fact that, um, I don't want to get, I don't want to get too many kickbacks for, for little things, the speed bumps. I like to, I, I'm a little bit of a robot in, in that regard where I just, I kind of do the same thing all the time. And I, then I, I feel pretty confident that, um, everything's going to be pretty smooth. I, I, in large part because of network television, you know, we had to deliver. So I, it took a while, but, um, you know, fine, fine tuned, uh, my, my back end for myself just to make my life uh, as, as easy as it could. Danica, I mean, from when they say, that's it, no more mixing. Um, uh, what happens then? And has that changed for you? Yes and no. Um, you know, there's always things that, you know, I feel like, uh, the supervisors or, or, or execs would, you know, they kind of sign off on it, right? Like, we're good. These are all my notes and, and we're good. And then there's, okay, see ya, bye. And then and then the re-recording mixers and, and us, you know, we, we kind of then do our round of tiny little notes that we would like to uh, do uh, that, you know, to kind of adjust some things uh, that just bother us, right? Um, that, uh, so, and then we, you know, then we, you know, we can go on and on if we really wanted, uh, but we kind of call it at a certain point. And then, um, yeah, we deliver. But I mean, depending on the show, um, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty standard, but then, you know, to, to a degree, it's, it's a little bit more intense <laughs> in that sense. Uh, there's some finicky things, you know, uh, I feel like sometimes, you know, if, if the tone drops, you know, during an out or something, it'll kick us kick back for dependent, you know, so, you know, just trying to catch all those little, little things that are, can kind of become annoying, um, can kind of dig at you, but uh, it's pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. Well, I would say over like the past 10 years, it seems QC notes have, have gotten out of control. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, I, I mean, for most of my career, I've never had a QC note. I didn't understand what that was. And then, Suddenly, you've got people like micro, you know, uh, they're looking, listening to every single stem track, you know, one track at a time, it seems like. And they and so you, you get all these notes and you're like, you know, so nervous, like, what what did they find? Oh, no. Um, one of the QC notes I had on the fighter was um, there's we have this training sequence and there's this breeder song and then the breeder song and the music, you know, stops and it starts up again. They said, well, there's a dropout in music. I'm like, no, that's the breeder song, you know, but, and, and we, we were worried that in the ultimate playlist of noise that we would get that same kind of a QC note because we go to absolute silence. I mean, there's nothing, there's no room tone. There's nothing for a period of the, of the film. 
And I thought for sure we were going to get a note and we didn't. Um, but getting back to like what you were saying about is a film um, ever finished. Um, we had just finished this film called um, Dog with uh, it's a Channing Tatum film. And we were all print master done getting deliverables. And suddenly the director comes back and says, I want to add two dog barks here. <laughs> and so we had to go back in and reopen it. And then, and then I've even worked on like extended versions of the, the Patriot and uh, Bugsy or not, Bugsy. It wasn't extended Bugsy. We did a, we did a five, one treatment of it. And so and like if you're George Lucas, it never ends, right? You just keep, <laughs> you keep going back into it. And I, I mean, it, I will say as a viewer, I've been really uh, pleased that there's sort of this effort from, you know, from the Dolby side, the manufacturing side, the display side to bring sort of cinema and home together, that experience. And I think that has really upped the demand for quality. Um, owned as somebody who dances back and forth between those two worlds, this sort of cinematic and home experience. Do you want to conclude with that? You, I mean, it's a good thing. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I've even, uh, I bought kind of a high end sound bar just to see, okay, because I think most of the people are going to be listening to like Atmos in this version, you know, because like, uh, you know, we mix for these big theatrical venues. And I'm always trying to stress to filmmakers to make sure that we the mixers who mix the film do the near field so that we can maintain the same quality. And um, because the near field is, you know, many times that's going to be how your films gonna live in perpetuity. So um, so yeah, so I, I bought a, you know, a sound bar and I, and, and I'm really happy with it. It's a, you know, it's amazing. It doesn't give you the exact, you know, accuracy that you would get in a theater, but you know, geez, for just putting, you know, one speaker in and one HDMI cable, it's amazing. Um, it has, it has impact, you know, I mean, that's, the, that's the nice thing. If the viewers notice impact and that, that sort of cinema experience in their living room, it only helps all of us. Um, yeah. I can second that. That that technology is amazing, yeah. and it's only going to be become even more mind blowing. Yeah, because I mean, it's literally it can ha sound like it's coming up here, and you're like, where is this sound coming from? You know, <laughs> I will say though, it's more of like, you know, it's kind of more like this as opposed to with an Atmos in a theatrical. It's like this and this. It's you know, it's all over the place. But still, you know, for one speaker, it's like uh, I, I would say it. I've, I've said that if you like technology and you like audio, it's a good time to be alive. I'd like to say thank you. I mean, we want to thank certainly Amazon Studios and uh, Prime Video. We'd like to thank Erica Wunsch and Formosa Group for bringing us the talent. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. Danica, Odin, and Joe. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Uh, and come back, audience. Thank you, too. We have more to come.